there is a treasure trove of strange and mysterious creatures inside a book we've known for thousands of years. The Bible is full of beasts. Did they really exist? Can they be found today, or are they just myth? Investigators are now re-examining the Bible, finding clues that will help us solve the mysteries surrounding miraculous animals. We now can find Jonah's whale, but it's not in the sea. The staff of Moses did not turn into a snake. We can dig up something bigger. If we can uncover Behemoth and Leviathan, tradition says we have to eat the monsters. Oh my god, look how long it is! And the serpent with legs in the Garden of Eden may actually exist. This is an amazing sight. To uncover the secrets, we need to decode ancient writings and unlock the hidden meanings inside symbols, myths, and legends. If we succeed, we will come face to face with the most mysterious beasts in the Bible. The most infamous beast in the Bible is the serpent, the most sinister inhabitant of the Garden of Eden. It was the serpent that tempted Eve. In the book of Genesis, the serpent has some disturbing characteristics. The traditional belief is that it was a creature with legs. The serpent found Eve in the garden and told her to taste the fruit from the tree of knowledge, the only fruit that God had forbidden both Adam and Eve to eat. If she ate the fruit, the serpent told Eve she would be like God and know the difference between good and evil. Tempted, Eve bit into the fruit and then shared it with Adam. And so God banished Adam and Eve from the garden and he cursed the serpent. On your belly you shall crawl and dust you will eat all the days of your life. The ancients said that this is the curse that changed the serpent into a snake. Its legs torn from its body. It's not surprising that this sinful tale has marked serpents with nasty reputations. For the ancients, these creatures always had dark and magical qualities. There's something unnatural about their movements and character. And a snake with legs? Well, that's just creepy. There could never have been such a creature. Or could there? Surprisingly, ancient Christian manuscripts provide us with several candidates. 
For centuries, the word serpent was applied to a number of different beasts with similar characteristics. There are detailed catalogs of these creatures that just may lead us to Eve's legged serpent. This is an 800-year-old bestiary, a book of beasts. Bestiaries are part of uh, an extraordinarily long-lived tradition uh, going into the Middle Ages, but one which has its roots going way back into the classical world. The one I'm looking at, dated to around the 12th century, you can actually see the pores of skin where the hide of the animal has been scraped, the hair has been scraped away, and on the other side you can see the veins on the flesh side. So it's a book about beasts, and it's made from the skin of beasts. In the ancient bestiaries, great attention was given to bizarre, exotic, and monstrous creatures. And the possible suspects for Eve's serpent, the legged snakes and salamanders, played the most powerful roles. Here in this bestiary, a remarkable picture uh, pertaining to the salamander, quite different from the creatures that we know today. We have a dead man lying on the ground. We have to the right a series of snake-like salamanders emerging from flames. And on the other side, the tail of a salamander disappearing into a well to infect it. And above, a spreading tree with salamanders winding round the branches to eat the apples and infect them to kill the man below. The salamander is what it says. I'll translate part of it. Among all poisonous creatures, it has the greatest power. For other poisonous creatures, kill one by one. But this creature kills very many people at the same time. For if it snakes its way into a tree, it can infect all the apples with poison. And anyone who eats those apples, it kills. Because this text mentions the salamander poisoning apples by climbing into a tree, very early on, it gets associated then with the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Could the serpent described in Genesis be a poisonous salamandra? If we go back in time, long before these bestiaries were written, we find a biblical commentary over 1,600 years old, and in it, Eve's serpent has some tree poisoning talents. In this text called the Apocalypse of Moses, Eve tells her children her own version of what happened with the tree and the serpent. And in her version, she says that the serpent poured the poison of his wickedness, which is lust, into the fruit of the tree and then took and bent down the branch low so that Eve could reach it. And she reached and took the fruit and ate of it. And as soon as she did, she knew everything had changed. This manuscript tells us that the serpent in Genesis poisoned the fruit of the tree before giving it to Eve, and the later bestiary image shows the creature known as the salamandra doing exactly the same thing. It leads us to a surprising new theory. The biblical serpent with legs may actually have been a salamander. Amazingly, many salamanders living today are poisonous. But could they really be powerful enough to poison the fruit of a tree? This little guy is a fire salamander. When he's full grown, he'll measure about 10 inches long. Now, he's called a fire salamander for two reasons. Number one, his skin is marked with a very fiery pattern, so a warning to predators. He has these beautiful, vivid yellow and orange markings in his body, which advertise the fact that he secretes venom onto his skin, which is why I'm going to have to wash my hands carefully after handling this little guy. In the Middle Ages, it was thought that they are highly venomous to the extent that there were legends about how a single salamander poisoned a river and killed thousands of people. In truth, the venom is not particularly powerful, certainly not enough to kill a person. The other reason why he's called a fire salamander is because of the ancient belief that he's generated in fire. People thought that salamanders were born in fire, and the medieval commentaries explain that blood, therefore, renders one fireproof. There is a long tradition associating the salamander with flames 
and Hellfire. People believed that the salamander couldn't be burned, just like the souls of the damned that remained unconsumed by the fires of hell. These devilish characteristics certainly make the beast an obvious candidate for Eve's satanic serpent. The belief in the creature's magical fireproof properties probably originates from a behavior common to many species of salamander, hibernating in rotting logs. When wood was brought indoors and put on the fire, the creatures mysteriously appeared from the flames. People began to believe that the salamander could grow fireproof wool, withstand any heat, and even put out fires. Now, this little guy doesn't have any wool, and he can't live in fire either. In fact, everything we know about modern science tells us that no creature is generated from fire. And many people likewise dismiss the idea of salamander blood having fireproof characteristics as being nothing more than an ancient myth with no basis in fact. However, zoologists have recently discovered that newts and salamanders do possess fireproof characteristics, not in their blood, but rather in various liquid secretions. Salamanders have glands which secrete fluids over their body to keep them moist. Now, zoologists have observed that when these salamanders pass through fire, they start secreting these fluids over their body. The fluids then froth up into a foam, which amazingly means that the salamander is able to pass through the flames unharmed. The foam dissipates the heat from their bodies. So as much as people today might dismiss the entire legend of the fireproof salamander as myth, we see that there is truth to it, as amazing as that is. So the ancients had it right. The salamander can secrete poison and walk through flames. But is this the legged serpent that tempted Eve? It turns out that the salamander is not our best candidate. The positive traditions surrounding the creature beat out its bad reputation. It was used most often to represent the good and holy, like saints that could withstand the flames of torture. The salamander even became a symbol for Jesus after his crucifixion on his journey through the fires of hell. And so, Associating the holy salamander with the sinful serpent that tempted Eve is a contradiction. But there are other contenders. If we go even further back in time, not just centuries, but millions of years, we find evidence for an extraordinary prehistoric predator that resembles the Genesis description. And that may lead us to a living serpent with legs. Today, biologists and paleontologists regard the story of the serpent with legs in the Garden of Eden as simply that, a story. But surprisingly, they do have something to say about snakes with legs. To the left, we have a savanna monitor lizard. And in my hand to the right here, we have a boa constrictor. Two animals that look superficially very different from each other. But we know from looking at their anatomy, the fossil record, and their genetic sequences, that these animals share a common ancestor about 100 million years ago. The snake body plan evolved from a body very similar to what we see in this lizard with four limbs, a short trunk, and a long tail into the body that we see in this boa with a very long trunk, no four limbs at all, and no shoulder girdle, and a very, very short tail. And amazingly enough, if you look at some species of snakes today, you can still see the remains of their hind limbs. In this ball python, we can see the remnants of the hind limbs as these very small little spurs at the base of the tail. Within these spurs are very small thigh bones, ephemera, which are the only remaining elements left of the hind limb in primitive snakes. It's hard to believe these tiny spurs are evidence that snakes once had legs, but recent discoveries of ancient fossils reinforce the theory. These fossils were recovered from shallow marine rocks dated between 99 and 95 million years old. These snakes show the body plan that we can see in living snakes, such as this python. The amazing thing about these snakes is that complete skeletons have been recovered that include external hind limbs, including feet and toes. 
Could this really be the fossil of an ancient snake leg? It just so happens that there is more evidence connecting this 95 million year old leg to modern snakes. Many living snakes today possess a specialized form of feeding called wide gape feeding. Wide gape feeding in snakes is a specialization where the bones of the skull and the jaw joint are actually suspended far behind the rest of the head relative to other lizards. This allows snakes to have a very long lower jaw that can swing out very deeply. Additionally, the bones of the lower jaw are not fused at the front of the mouth as they are in mammals and other animals. Instead, these two bones remain separate, and when a snake opens its mouth, they're able to swing wide apart to create a very deep gape, which allows snakes to eat a variety of large-bodied prey. Biologists consider wide gape feeding an advanced characteristic found only in snakes. The 99 million year old skulls discovered among recent fossils show adaptations for wide gape feeding. It means that these ancient skulls are definitely snake, not lizard, not dinosaur. And because the skulls are attached to skeletal bodies that have legs, they just may be a direct link connecting modern snakes to ancient snakes with legs. Could a fossil snake with legs be the great, great, great grandfather of all modern snakes? It's an interesting idea, especially when comparing the Genesis story to the evolution of snakes. In the Garden of Eden, after being cursed by God, the serpent loses its legs. Modern science points to the fossil record and millions of years of evolution to show the same result. The serpent lost its legs as it evolved to burrow. Today, primitive living snakes are all burrowers, which has led some people to conclude that snakes actually originated their elongate body plan and reduced limbs for a burrowing lifestyle. And there is a burrowing beast that exists today that biologists classify under squamata the same lineage as all snakes and lizards. It is in the strange subcategory of Amphisbania, the worm lizards, where we find yet another suspect for Eve's serpent with legs. This is the bipes. These subterranean Amphisbanians have two powerful front legs each foot has five sharp claws that allow the bipeds to tunnel efficiently through the soil. They spend most of their time in shallow tunnels feeding on ants, termites, and larvae. This particular species can be found in Baja, California, and Mexico, but it has close relatives in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. The legged serpent, a creature considered by most as only mythical, may actually exist today. The salamander, the amphisbania, the prehistoric snake, all three possess, or at one time possessed, legs. Exactly what kind of creature the book of Genesis tells us God cursed may never be known. But we now have three possible suspects or perhaps we have three descendants of the serpent that tempted Eve. Whether legged or legless, the serpent was an incredible symbol of power. It appears in many verses of the Bible and even slithers into the hands of Moses, which leads us to another mystery. But this time, the secret is inside a rod and the serpent transforms into something much more powerful. The ancient Hebrew of the Bible describes fantastic beasts that are incredible symbols of power. But modern translations often contain mistakes that are misleading. By going back to the original text, we can uncover animals lost to us for centuries and one of the most beastly secrets in the Bible slithers beside the serpent that God gave to Moses.
It is written that God's voice came to Moses from a burning bush. He told Moses to free the Hebrews from Pharaoh's slavery, lead them out of Egypt and into the promised land. He assured Moses that he would help him to perform wonders, to convince the Egyptians of his power. He commanded Moses to throw down his staff. The ancient texts tell us that the staff of Moses transformed into a nachash. Nachash in Hebrew means snake. Grab it by its tail, said God. And Moses did. The snake turned back into a rod. And so Moses went back to Egypt to enlist his brother Aaron. It was time to take the rod and challenge Pharaoh. In ancient Israel and in ancient Egypt, a rod was more than just a walking stick. It was a symbol of power. It represented leadership and authority. In Hebrew, the word is mateh. And mateh means rod, but it also has another meaning, which is tribe. And so mateh is not only the rod that the leader holds, but also the tribe over which the leader has power. In Exodus, we're told that Moses' tribe was in trouble. Pharaoh had enslaved his people, and so he and Aaron travel into the heart of Egypt to challenge Pharaoh, to shout their now famous words, let my people go. But this time, the Bible tells us God placed a mighty power in Aaron's rod. The Bible makes it clear that it was Aaron the brother of Moses who threw the rod before Pharaoh. Sure that the Hebrews' God was powerless, Pharaoh demands to see a miracle. And Aaron throws down his staff. Back at the burning bush, when Moses threw down his staff, it transformed into a nachash, a snake. And most translations of the Exodus story describe the same thing happening for Aaron. But they've got it all wrong. That's not at all what materialized in front of Pharaoh. The original Hebrew tells us that when Aaron threw down his rod, it transformed into a tanim, a beast considered to be so powerful by the Egyptians that they dedicated entire temples to the creature. Constructed with such devotion that the massive ruins still stand 3,000 years later. What kind of beast was this Tanin? Why was it so revered? And how does it change our understanding of the Bible? When Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh and Aaron throws down his staff, it turns into a Tanin. Now the word Tanin is used here in reference to that stated in the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel speaks of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, as being the great Tanin who lives in the river Nile and declares himself king and creator of all his surroundings. What is the great Tanin in the river Nile? It's the Nile crocodile, the number one predator in Egypt. The way Ezekiel tells it, God compared Pharaoh to the great Tanin crouching in the river. And then God warned the crocodile I will put hooks in your jaws, and I will pull you out of your streams. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is symbolically represented as being the great Nile crocodile. And so, for centuries, there has been a mistranslation of Tanin, probably stemming back to when the Bible was translated from Hebrew to Greek. But Ezekiel makes it clear that a Tanin is not a snake. So in the book of Exodus, when Aaron challenges Pharaoh and throws down his staff, God gives him control of a monstrous Nile crocodile. Pharaoh calls to his priests, commanding them to throw down their staffs. And so begins the battle.
What is the significance behind the fact that Aaron's rod transformed into a crocodile when challenging the ruler of Egypt? The mystery surrounding this biblical beast begins here. On these great stone columns and walls is evidence that one of the oldest and most revered of the Egyptian deities was the crocodile god, Sobek. We are in the temple of Kamambo in the southern part of Egypt, lying on the banks of the Nile. It's an unusual temple because it's dedicated to the infinitely glamorous crocodile god, Sobek. Sobek was often shown as a man with a crocodile head or just as a crocodile. Sobek was one of the most important gods in the Egyptian pantheon. He was probably one of the top 10 or 15 gods. And over time, his popularity grew and grew. Part of this was because he was a combination of a fertility god and a sun god. The ancient Egyptians chose a crocodile for Sobek because they believed the crocodile had magical powers. Female crocodiles seemed to know when the Nile's waters would flood. Just before the flood, they would lay 18 to 80 eggs. Their nests would always be above the line of the flood and therefore never disturbed by the rushing waters. The other thing, of course, is that crocodiles spend a lot of time on the sandbanks sunning themselves, and that made them a very ideal choice to be a solar deity. And if you look at the scales of a crocodile, they shine in the light, and they look like gold, and again, this is reflective of the sun. The Egyptians actually had a live crocodile in a pool in the back of the temple, and this was supposed to be the incarnation of the god Sobek, and pilgrims would come and visit him, bringing him offerings of food and drink, meat and bread and even wine, so the crocodile would be appeased. So to kill a sacred crocodile would be an incredible crime. So, in the tale of Exodus, God transforms Aaron's staff into one of Egypt's most celebrated animals. Aaron's control over the mighty Nile crocodile would have challenged Pharaoh's every fiber of belief. It looked as if his god Sobek was in trouble. If Aaron's crocodile could win this battle, how much of a challenge would that be to Pharaoh's power? The recently unearthed mummified remains of 2,000-year-old crocodiles just may hold the answers. Believe it or not, there are secrets inside the belly of this biblical beast. The Bible describes marvelous and fantastic creatures. New investigations into the origins of these beasts have uncovered shocking truths. For centuries, there have been monsters hiding from us in plain sight. It all goes back to a mistranslation in the biblical tale of the Exodus. In the Hebrew text, Aaron's rod does not transform into a snake. It becomes a mighty Nile crocodile. For any pharaoh, this would have been very intimidating. The crocodile was one of Egypt's most revered gods. If Aaron's crocodile could swallow pharaohs, how much kingly power was at stake? The true meaning behind the Exodus showdown can finally be uncovered with the help of a crocodile mummy. This crocodile is at least 2,000 years old, but probably more like 2,300 or something like that. Crocodiles were mummified because the Egyptians believed that, of course, you live eternally, and gods, too, are eternal. And they believed that the spirit of the god Sobek came into a sacred crocodile that was in residence at the temple. And when the crocodile died, they would mummify it and bury it with great pomp and splendor because, of course, it was a god. Now, sometimes, so that the crocodiles would keep their shape, they stuffed their internal cavities with papyrus, 
and sometimes they were inscribed. So some of the crocodile mummies are not only interesting because they are mummies of crocodiles, but also because they have given us hundreds and thousands of documents from ancient Egypt. In the early 1900s, hidden in the shifting sands outside the ancient Egyptian town of Teptunis, archaeologists uncovered 1,500 crocodile mummies. 31 of these mummies were stuffed with papyri. The crocodile cavities contained a veritable bouillabaisse of ancient texts spanning not just centuries, but cultures. Amongst the writings were Greek poems and plays, suggesting that the crocodile cult was not only popular with Egyptians. A hundred years later, archaeologists are still unearthing this city. What can the ancient fragments tell us about the significance of Aram's crocodile in the Exodus story? Can the new discoveries here shine light on our biblical beast? If you're asking crocodile questions in Teptunis, there's only one man to talk to, Claudio Galazzi. And one of this professor's most favorite places to dig is just down this ancient road and outside the walls of another crocodile temple. Now we are beside the temple of uh, the crocodile gods. The most important god of Teptunis was the crocodile. As you can see, beside the temple, we have an empty area. In this empty area, we collect thousands and thousands of papyri. And many papyri fragments unearthed by Galazzi's team contain questions to the crocodile god Sobek. The people wrote on the small paper the question, or sometimes many questions, then presented to the gods in order to have an answer concerning some personal problem. Example, I must go to Alexandria or not? Example, who stole my clothes? Cronion, Irini, or another person? The people present question to the crocodile because the crocodile god was oracular god. An oracular god was considered a wise counselor, able to predict the future. Because the ancient Egyptians witnessed the crocodilian habit of predicting flood lines, never laying eggs too low on the banks of the Nile, they considered the crocodile a psychic deity. After receiving the written notes in the crocodile temple, the priests, apparently channeling Sobek, would provide written answers. The original questions were then buried in the sands outside the temple wall. These small papyri prayers have been sealed shut for over 2,000 years. The secrets they hold can show us the true power behind Pharaoh's crocodile god. Okay. Yes, a few days ago, in this area, in a few square meters, we collect 55 oracular question that you can see in our laboratory. Some of them contain simple requests. Others, advice on marriage. Others still list a variety of suspects for a variety of crimes, asking Sobek to pick out the culprits. Uh, actually, it is a name. It is a name of a person, a masculine name. Inaros Apolloniou Machimos. Inaros, son of Apollonius, a soldier. So they ask the crocodile god uh, a question concerning this name. All together, they paint a pretty vivid picture. We can uh, see a real picture of the life of uh, more than 2,000 years ago. And what the picture shows is that Sobek, the crocodile god, had become one of the most popular deities in the Middle Kingdom. Romans and Greeks began to believe in the Egyptian god. Moses and Aaron's god would have been up against some serious worship. And so, when we read the correct translation of the Exodus story and Aaron's rod transforms into a crocodile, not a snake, 
the symbolism becomes crystal clear. For the first time in millennia, the true meaning behind this biblical beast is unveiled. In the Exodus showdown, when Aaron's crocodile faces Pharaoh's god Sobek, ancient Egypt's entire worldview is at stake. According to the Bible, Aaron's crocodile slid across the blood-stained courtyard and gulped down every last one of Pharaoh's reptiles. And Pharaoh's power went down with them all. The Bible tells us that Pharaoh didn't get the message. His heart was stubborn. He ignored the warnings and crocodile casualties, and he refused to free Moses and Aaron's people. It was a mistake that brought disaster upon Egypt. According to the book of Exodus, God punished Pharaoh and unleashed his many beasts on land and in water. These were the ten biblical plagues, and six of them involved beasts. What's most concerning is that every single one of these mini monsters still exists today. The Bible is full of beasts. But just how literally are we supposed to interpret the monsters of scripture? We have found the answers by re-examining the ancient manuscripts and what we've uncovered is very real. In the Exodus story, when Pharaoh refused to free the Israelites from slavery, we're told that God unleashed hell upon Egypt. Six of the 10 biblical plagues involved beasts being small didn't mean these critters weren't deadly. Their incredible numbers made these mini-monsters unbearable. And while some of these creatures are well known, others are shrouded in mystery. After turning the River Nile to blood, the Bible says God commanded Aaron to stretch his staff over the water. Hordes of frogs jumped out and smothered Egypt. To decode what beasts followed the frogs, we have to go back to the original words. Unlike modern English, Biblical Hebrew has a very small vocabulary, so one word can mean different things in different contexts. So when we're looking at the Biblical plague stories, looking at these words uh, referring to the different plagues, our English translations might be very different from what the ancients who first told and heard these stories were imagining. It's plague number three where the mysteries really begin. The popular understanding of this plague and those that followed is ripe with mistranslation. The third plague is the plague of, in Hebrew, kinim. Kinim means biting insects. Now, a lot of uh, traditional English translations have translated that as the plague of lice, and they do bite, but it would make just as much or maybe more sense to translate it as mosquitoes or gnats, which are much more aggressive. The aggressive, blood-sucking, and disease-carrying swarms of mosquitoes and gnats sound devastating and make for a much more monstrous plague number three. The fourth plague was flies, or was it something much worse? The fourth plague is the plague of Arov. In Hebrew, Arov refers to a swarm, a swarm of what is less clear. The idea that this was a plague of flies probably goes back to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of Hebrew scriptures. In the Septuagint, the word Arov was translated into a Greek word that refers to a dog fly. And so we get, for the fourth plague, a plague of flies. 
But the Greeks got it wrong. The Hebrew word arov could apply to a mixture of stinging swarms. So, in the tale of Exodus, God most likely sent flies and swarms of stinging insects like hornets and wasps. Now, that's a better plague. According to the Bible, God removed this plague only after Pharaoh promised to release the Hebrews. However, Pharaoh once again broke his promise, and so God unleashed an unspecified killing disease. But exactly what disease was it? The Bible tells us the horses, the donkeys, the camels, all the Egyptian livestock was dead within a day. Perhaps we should look to the smallest but deadliest beast known to man, bacteria. The highly lethal Bacillus anthracis. It's the bacterium in anthrax. Once inside the bloodstream, the anthrax bacilli release toxins that destroy clotting agents, causing horrible tissue destruction and death. It literally causes the infected animal or person to bleed out from every orifice. This microscopic bacterium is only one by nine micrometers in size, but it is one of the most deadly beasts ever unleashed. The biblical description of the fifth plague and its devastation to Egypt's livestock fits with modern scientific descriptions of the effects of anthrax. But according to Exodus chapter nine, this was not the only tiny beast God unleashed. For the sixth plague, God tells Moses and Aaron to go and get ashes from the furnace and take them before Pharaoh and then have Moses throw the ashes up into the heavens and the ashes will spread out across the land of Egypt and cause shaheen on both animals and people. Shaheen in Hebrew uh, usually means boils. This is the plague of boils. Festering skin eruptions on the Egyptians and their livestock. An oozing, pus-filled beast that quite likely was another bacteria, perhaps the group Staphylococcus aureus. While not as deadly as anthrax, it is still the cause of life-threatening infections and is the most probable candidate for plague number six. And then came the locusts. The great brown locust, indigenous to Egypt, is about three inches in length. It has a large open mouth, two jaws, and four teeth, which work like scissors to grab or cut. According to the Bible, the eighth plague was locusts. Millions and millions of these beasts filled the sky and cast a dark shadow over Egypt. They consumed the fields and trees, eating everything in their path. Frogs, flies, mosquitoes, wasps, locusts, and bacteria. The correct translations and scientific analyses finally provide a complete understanding of what would have been total devastation to the land of Egypt. After this barrage of beasts, Pharaoh finally let the Israelites go. The Bible tells us that their trek to the Promised Land took 40 years. When they finally entered the land of Canaan, the Israelites met the Philistines, a formidable enemy who worshipped a god that many say was half human, half fish. Could such a creature really exist? thousand-year-old mysteries surrounding miraculous creatures in the Bible. Beasts that seem too far out to be real. But there have been many tales of unfamiliar animals initially dismissed as superstition that were later proven to have a basis in biological fact. Today we can uncover ancient biblical clues to separate reality from myth and the mermaids from 
the mere men. Could merfolk really exist? Tradition suggests they were worshipped as gods in ancient Judea. Legends of mermaids and mermen are incredibly old and span the globe. Throughout history, they have been called many names. Sirens, Silkies, Tritons, Morgans, and Nixies. And in some places like Wikiwachi, Florida, they are very real creatures. I do believe mermaids exist. I think, why not? The ocean's a big place. It's filled with many creatures, and there's been sightings throughout the centuries of mermaids. So why not believe in them? Surprisingly, mermaid tales go as far back as the Bible. The first known mermaid story is 3,000 years old from Assyria. The tradition of the merman has been said to go back even further. Sumer, located in southern Mesopotamia, modern-day Syria and Iraq, is one of the earliest known civilizations in the world, and many Sumerian cultures worshipped Dagon, the great god who became known as half-man, half-fish. And the popular belief is that the biblical Philistines, the Israelites' biggest rival, worship the same fish god. In the Hebrew Bible, they describe the Philistines as one of the primary enemies of the Israelites. One of the aspects which is depicted in the Hebrew Bible is the god of the Philistines, Dagon. Today, on a hilltop in the middle of Tel Aviv, there are Philistine ruins that just may have been an ancient temple for Dagon. We know that the biblical text talks about a temple of Dagon in Gaza and a temple of Dagon in Ashdod. There is a, a, a strong possibility that the temple we see below us here uh, at Kasila, a Philistine temple, could be also a, Phil a Philistine temple of the god Dagon. Could it be that the biblical enemies of the Israelites actually worshipped a half-man, half-fish god behind these very walls? There's a popular understanding of the name Dagon connecting to a, to a fish-like god. And the reason being is that the name Dagon reminded many people of the Hebrew word dag, which means fish. And so from the medieval period and onwards, commentators on the Bible have suggested that the god Dagon was a fish-like god. And in fact, if you Google Dagon nowadays, you will come up with hundreds of depictions and hundreds of uh, people writing and connecting the Dagon with a fish-like god. Associating the ancient religious text with merfolk is just as prevalent today as it was in the Middle Ages. The half-human, half-fish deity swims through hundreds of websites tagged as the god of the biblical Philistines. How do we explain the enormous amount of literature devoted to this creature? For thousands of years, the human-fish combo has crossed oceans and cultures spanning Portugal, India, Haiti, China, Africa, England, Germany, Russia, and Japan. Why has the mermaid been so popular throughout the ages right up until today in so many cultures? Cryptozoologists like Lauren Coleman will tell you it's because these creatures actually exist. They're just not so pretty. One of the animals of interest to cryptozoology is the mermaid. And the popular image of a mermaid is of a beautiful woman. But what if the creature is something else? What if it's a sea cow? What if it's a manatee? A lot of people have said, how could people misinterpret this animal as a mermaid? Obviously, to each other, they look beautiful. But to humans, it is apparent that they're a rather ugly animal. One thing that does speak to the fact that manatees and sea cows sometimes look like humans is that they have a posture in the water in which they really sit upright and take the baby sea cows and nurse them very much like a human. And sailors on ships looking very far away could have interpreted this as 
human beings as mermaids giving milk to their babies. But reports of mermaids are cross-cultural, historically very old, and that gives us some clue that mermaids cannot just be explained by sea cows or manatees, because some of these reports are from areas where there have never been manatees. So what else is going on? I myself think that a lot of mermaid sightings may not be manatees, but indeed may be seals, because seals are thinner, they have a head that's much more mermaid-like. Seals and sea lions certainly seem to fit better with the mermaid description. Their large, forward-facing eyes and human-like faces make up a much prettier package than the sea cow. Additionally, seals and sea lions call to each other while on shore, and the quality of their cries can sound incredibly human. There are several species of seals with habitats in most of the world's oceans, seas, and even some freshwater lakes. Considering the theories of mermaid misidentifications, the seal's global presence makes it an ideal candidate to propagate a worldwide myth. So, merfolk are most likely seals. But what does that tell us about Dagon, the supposed half-human, half-fish god of the biblical Philistines? Were the ancient enemies of the Israelites simply confusing seals with gods? If you would travel through a time tunnel back to Philistia in 1000 BCE and ask him if there's any connection between the god Dagon and a fish god, a Philistine would probably say that's a very fishy idea. There is no basis for this. And the reason being is in all our knowledge of Philistine archaeology, we don't have depictions of gods in the shape of fish. It is something that appears from the Middle Ages onwards. Because the word dog means fish in Hebrew, medieval translators of the Bible depicted Dagon as a fish god. And in mermaid-crazy medieval Europe, it became a hugely popular mistake that even today we can't seem to unhook from the good book. The fact is that the entire word Dagon relates much better to the Hebrew word Dagan. The Hebrew word Dagan, which is grain, we know of a Semitic god, an ancient Semitic god from the period before the Philistines, the Bronze Age, of a god by the name of Dagon, who was related to fertility of grain and agricultural fertility. And in fact, it seems from what we can tell from the ancient remains of the Philistines is the, the main god of the Philistines was in fact a goddess. And it was probably a goddess like a mother goddess, sort of like a Gaia of the ancient Greek cultures. And it could very well be that the Dagon, the male god of the Philistines, is in fact a evolution from something that originally was a female deity during the times of the Bible. It makes more sense that the Philistines worshipped a deity that they believed supplied their daily bread. A mother goddess or god of fertile grain seems a smarter choice than a fishy man with a tail. And so the mer-god associated with the Bible is merely a myth, resulting from a medieval mistranslation. The belief in this biblical beast is busted. But there are other beasts most definitely described in the biblical seas, much more difficult to pass off as myth. What would you say if we told you that we found the whale that swallowed Jonah? There are strange creatures in the Bible that fall outside of normal scientific classification. Did they ever exist? Could they be found today, or are they just myth? One of the most famous biblical beasts swallowed the prophet Jonah whole. But how can a fish so large be swimming in mystery? If it exists, why can't it be found? According to the Hebrew Bible, Jonah was consumed because of his sin against God. 
He had refused God's order to preach in a condemned city. Instead, he fled and set sail across the Mediterranean Sea. God then called up a terrible storm. Jonah told the sailors that he was to blame. To satisfy God and calm the storm, they would have to throw him overboard. The oldest biblical texts tell us that God summoned a great fish, which later texts translated as a whale. But was this great fish a whale? Or was it something else? The ancients did not have scuba gear or underwater subs. What lurked in the deep, dark waters of the sea was a mystery. Great underwater beasts would surface now and then, but they would only give sailors a glimpse of their anatomy. Much was left to the imagination. And so descriptions and illustrations of sea creatures back then often don't match what we know of sea animals today. But the Book of Jonah was written thousands of years ago. Perhaps there were creatures then that no longer exist in our oceans. The Bible says Jonah survived inside the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights. He begged God forgiveness for his disobedience. Only then did the fish spit out Jonah. Is it possible that a man could be swallowed whole and live? What sort of fish could accomplish such a feat? This is a, uh, a fossil representation of the great white shark, but uh, the modern shark gets to about this size. This was uh, a large shark, probably uh, 20 feet uh, or so in length. And the teeth of white sharks uh, are large and serrated uh, and designed for taking uh, chunks out of their victims. So as a result, uh, most attacks by white sharks on humans result in serious injuries, uh, which then precludes the possibility of a human being being consumed whole by a white shark without any damage. However, in the past, there were, there were large sharks uh, in the fossil record uh, that were large enough to consume a, a human being uh, without causing such damage. Uh, these ancestors of the white shark uh, and the mako shark uh, grew to much uh, larger sizes than they are today. And one in particular, the megatooth shark, uh, or megalodon, uh, grew to a large size, uh, uh, 40 feet or so in length. About 100 million years ago, this animal was the granddaddy of all sharks, the apex predator at the top of the food chain. We know it ate such things as manatees uh, and whales, uh, ancestors to, to modern baleen whales. The enormous teeth of the megalodon have been found embedded in the bones of prehistoric whales. This massive shark ate whales for lunch. The problem with this being our choice of an animal that consumed a human whole was that it wasn't found on the earth at the same time as humans. Humans simply were not here at the same time as the megalodon was swimming in the ocean. However, there are other sharks that get larger than the modern white shark. Uh, these are the basking shark, megamouth shark, and whale shark, all of which get to sizes of 20 to 40 feet in length. The basking shark and whale shark are commonly seen by divers, but the megamouth shark is a rare species, only discovered in 1976. What do these three sharks have in common? 
uh, besides their large size. Uh, first and foremost, all three of these species are plankton feeding sharks. Plankton refers to very minute shrimp-like organisms that live in the water column. To feed on plankton, all three species of shark, whale, bass king, and megamouth, have very large mouths but small throats lined with gill rakers, slender structures that form a fine mesh which filters the minute organisms from the water. A human, if it was unfortunate enough to be swallowed by uh, one of these animals, would find the sieve-like structure uh, and not be able to go any farther. The filter structures found in plankton eaters also rules out the largest animals in the sea. Baleen whales, like the blue whale, which grows to over 100 feet in length, have sieve-like mechanisms that wouldn't allow a human into their guts. But what about the toothed whales? The killer whale, uh, despite its fierce reputation and large teeth, have never been documented as attacking a human being. The sperm whales, uh, which get uh, to 50 feet or more in length and have large teeth, much like the killer whales, also have never been documented as actually attacking a human being. So as a result, uh, we can again take these three uh, groups of marine mammals and cross them off our list. Even if one is so unlucky to be swallowed by a whale or a shark, the acids in the stomach of these animals is so caustic that nobody could hope to survive, even if one found themselves in the belly of this beast. It looks as if there is no great fish existing today or in the past that could perform Jonah's miracle. But this whale may be swimming in metaphor. In the book of Genesis, it is said that God divided the waters below heaven from the waters above. Perhaps searching underwater for the beast is altogether the wrong place to start. Perhaps we should be looking to the sky. This is a 400-year-old star chart, an ancient mariner's map of the night sky. It's covered by constellations depicting all kinds of celestial beasts. Between the 21st and 24th of December, the nights are the darkest and longest of the entire year. And in 760 BCE, the days of Jonah, the winter solstice was known to ancient astrologers as the whale's belly. Because during those long nights, there was one constellation that swallowed the sky. With modern planetarium software, we can actually travel back thousands of years to view the night sky from any location on Earth. So what I'm going to set up here is the night sky for 760 BC. I'm going to set our location just above the Mediterranean. And the date is December 21st. So this would have been the longest night of the year during those really dark winter months. Now, I want to bring up a constellation known as Cetus. Now, Cetus was fabled to be a mythical sea monster or a giant amphibious whale. And this constellation is huge. It's actually the fourth largest constellation in our night sky. It's made up of about 15 faint stars, five of which make up the enormous head of this creature, spanning down into its giant whale-like tail. And because it's so enormous, you can actually only see it in its entirety between the months of October and January. So on this date of December 21st, at about 8.30 in the evening, we can just see that Cetus is just above the southern horizon, and you can see it just sitting there, stretching across that part of the sky. During the three longest nights of the year, sailing under this constellation was called being in the whale's belly. The story of Jonah's whale may be carrying a simple message. A man who sins is consumed by darkness, and a man who begs forgiveness shall be released from darkness. For millennia, people have taken the biggest fish story in history literally. But this beast is really swimming in the stars. However, 
there is another biblical tradition linking beasts, bellies, and repentance. Two massive monsters are supposed to appear at the end of days, but they don't eat us. We get to eat them. Today, investigators are re-examining ancient biblical texts, uncovering clues that might lead us to the most extraordinary animals. In the earliest commentaries on the Hebrew Bible, rabbis presented a vision of a future feast. According to their predictions, there will be two enormous roast beasts, one taken from land and one from sea, prepared and plopped on the dinner plates at the end of days. Based on their readings of Hebrew scriptures, the earliest rabbis began to imagine that there would be this spectacular banquet at the end of time that would be hosted for the righteous ones. And on the menu for this banquet would be these two enormous, monstrous creatures, Behemoth and Leviathan. It's made clear in ancient texts that the righteous will dine on the divine flesh of these creatures. But exactly what are they, and where can they be found? So when we try to take these biblical texts literally and just look at these monsters, behemoth and leviathan, what we find really is a, a very profound sense of mystery, even unnerving mystery. In the book of Job, the Bible describes behemoth as having bones like tubes of bronze, limbs like bars of iron. He can stiffen his tail like a cedar, and he can draw the river Jordan into his mouth. The behemoth is described in the book of Job as being a large and powerful animal that lives on the rivers of swamp. It's described as being an animal that eats grass and that stiffens his tail like a cedar, and which has a large mouth. What is this animal? Some have suggested that it's referring to a sauropod dinosaur. A sauropod dinosaur, like the famous Brontosaurus, is a large, powerful animal. It lives in the swamp, and it has a tail like a cedar tree. It's a bizarre theory to suggest that dinosaurs will be eaten by man. But cryptozoologists believe a sauropod could still exist today. There are legends from deep in the Congo that tell of a creature known as Mokole Mbembe. It means the one who stops the flow of rivers. Intriguingly, cryptozoologists actually know of a story in Central Africa of a dinosaur-like creature. It's called Mokilium Mbembe, and these animals seen in the Congo are said to look like a seropod, a dinosaur that looks like this. It has a big body, a bulbous body, a tail straight out to the back, and a neck that's long. The native peoples have seen this, they talk about it. It's in their history, it's in their native traditions. Many expeditions have gone to Africa. In fact, the Smithsonian was the first organization to send an expedition in 1920 and 21 in search of evidence. Is it really possible that dinosaurs have remained hidden for millennia deep in the African jungles? Is there a behemoth in the bush? just waiting to be eaten by the righteous at the end of days. Some of the expeditions indeed in the 1960s and 1970s brought back the story of native villagers who had eaten part of a mokilium and bembe and died. On all of these expeditions, we keep getting these stories of different kinds of mokilium and bembe. And another one that we often hear about is represented here in this carving called the Killer of Elephants. This is a native carving of one of these creatures. They're said to have a big body and the straight tail that we keep hearing in the Bohemoth story. And this may actually help us with a misidentification that could be going on. For indeed, this kind of Mokilium Bembe may be an African version of an unknown species of rhinoceros that's aquatic. Not a dinosaur, but a rhino. The possibility of an unknown species of rhinoceros is intriguing, and an undiscovered dinosaur even more enticing. 
But perhaps it's more reasonable to look at another creature, alive, well known in many rivers today and fitting most of the ancient descriptions of the behemoth. It seems that the animal being described is the hippopotamus. The hippopotamus is certainly a large, powerful animal. It eats grass like cattle, and it lives in the swamp. A hippopotamus can stand five feet tall and 10 feet long. They weigh up to four tons. Their jaws open to a gape of four feet, with teeth that are 20 inches long. They're herbivorous, but they're very territorially aggressive. They kill more people every year in Africa than any other large animal. If you come into their part of the river, they will stomp you or they will chomp you. Either way, you are gonna. Could the predicted banquet for the righteous at the end of days really include hippo on a plate? It seems an overly strange surf and turf menu. Before we decide on the turf, let us turn the investigation to the surf, the Leviathan. The book of Isaiah describes the Leviathan as a twisted sea serpent. In the book of Job, it is written that when Leviathan is hungry, he sends forth from his mouth a heat so great as to make all the waters of the deep boil. Terror surrounds his teeth. He makes the mighty afraid and is impenetrable by sword. Some scholars suggest that the ancient texts are referring to a prehistoric plesiosaur existing in the deepest depths of the oceans, unchanged throughout the millennia. But others put forth living creatures that have actually been seen, strange oceanic aliens like the oarfish. This is an amazing sight. Oh my God, look at the this, thing is, this thing is probably at least 50. Also called the king of herrings, the oarfish is the longest bony fish in the ocean and can reach up to 36 feet in length. Its flesh is of a goopy, gelatinous consistency, and it sports a majestic cardinal red dorsal fin. The oarfish is rarely seen because it frequents depths up to 3,000 feet, and it wasn't until 1996 that an oarfish was filmed alive. But as large as this fish gets, fearsome it is not. The oarfish is toothless, feeds on plankton, and is quite harmless. Not really the apocalyptic sea serpent described in the Book of Job. In fact, the deeper we fish the biblical seas in search of clues for Leviathan, the more we discover that the traditions surrounding this creature are contradictory. And if we chase the fish into later Christian tradition, we find that we really aren't fishing or a fish at all. We see in Jewish tradition how the rabbis imagined that Leviathan was actually a creature of God who would serve a purpose within creation in the end times uh, as the main course uh, for this final banquet. In Christian tradition, it goes in a very different direction. Part of the reason for that is that in the uh, Greek translation of Hebrew scriptures, known as the Septuagint, the proper name Leviathan gets translated into Greek as drachon. Drachon is simply Greek for what it sounds like, dragon. So Leviathan became a kind of generic dragon. It seems that Christian writers changed the great serpent fish into a dragon. In the books of the New Testament, Leviathan has lost his fins, lost his name, and has gone to the devil. Uh, Leviathan really informs the image in the book of Revelation of the red dragon, who is Satan and the devil in Revelation 12. In Revelation, the apocalyptic visions include God saving a Christ child from being devoured by the red dragon. If this is the same dragon, the same dracone that is Leviathan, then the tasty fish for the God-given banquet has been changed into very unpalatable and satanic monster meat. When it comes to Leviathan and Behemoth, clearly there is a disagreement over the nature and purpose of the biblical monsters. The Bible actually, I think, 
glorifies and lifts up that sense of ambiguity and mystery and unknowability in Leviathan and in Behemoth. Mystery, the root of the word mystery is unknowing, not knowing, and, and these creatures really are, in some sense, personifications, monstrous personifications of unknowing. There is a sense of horror to all religious experience, insofar as religious experience is about encountering otherness. And these figures of Leviathan and Behemoth really represent that for us in the biblical literature. You know, in some ancient maps uh, out there along the edges of the mapped known world, the terra cognita was the, the terra incognita, the unknown territory. And on some maps, you'd find a note there, uh, here be dragons or here be monsters. We have that in the uh, biblical world as well. There are monsters out there, and they represent that sense of the terra incognita, the unknown, the ungrounding that is there around the edges of the known and the well-grounded. And so the search for Leviathan and Behemoth will remain in uncharted territory. Our attempts to uncover such beasts seem futile for it is their purpose to be unknown. However, there are creatures described in the Bible that do provide access to the unknown and the divine. These angels may open the gates to heaven in the end of days, but they're not the pudgy, cute babies with wings we all know. The cherub just may be the weirdest and most horrific creature ever designed. Scattered throughout the Bible, there are clues that point to a famous but horrific messenger of God, a tetramorph, a combination of four creatures that make up the angel known as the cherub. The real message this angel carries has been lost through the centuries. It is a terrifying creature, not the pudgy, naked boy many artists have depicted. By examining its descriptions in detail, we can finally reveal the true meaning behind its design. The best man for the job is Ezekiel. He was the prophet who got the best look at the cherub. In a vision, Ezekiel saw a storm. A wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with flashing fire. Inside, there were figures resembling four living beings, and they traveled like bolts of lightning. The ancient text explains that inside the beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire. Each creature had four wings and four faces, translated from the ancient Hebrew as lion, man, ox, and eagle. These were the cherubim. We're told that they carried the wheels to God's throne. And Ezekiel was taken on one wild ride. The cherub is one of the most holy, yet most terrifying beasts in the Bible. It is ranked second in the Bible's top 10 of holy angels and it flies through many of the Bible's books, chapters, and verses. There are a number of other references to cherubs or cherubim in the Hebrew Bible besides in the book of Ezekiel. For example, in Psalm 18, God rides a cherub. In other Psalms, cherubim are surrounding the throne of God or, or, or supporting the throne of God. And of course, there are two cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant acting almost as guardians of that ark. The most famous cherubim are probably the cherubim that God places at the entrance to the Garden of Eden in order to prevent Eve and Adam from returning after they have been exiled. A guardian of arks and gates, 
Was the cherub simply considered a brawny bouncer, keeping man from entering sacred places? For the ancients, it would have represented ultimate power. The strongest animals that exist in the ancient Near Eastern repertoire are the lion and the bull. Both represent raw power at its ultimate. In addition to that, you also have the eagle, the most powerful of the uh, birds that are in the sky. Needless to say, if you combine all three of them, the bull, the lion, and the eagle, you have the ultimate power. You have the, the, the strongest thing that you can imagine. In modern day terms, it's combining a nuclear submarine, an Abrams tank, and an F-16, all packed into one package. So the cherub is a complete power package, a combination of man and three animal kings. The lion is considered king of the beasts, its mane a royal crown. Weighing up to 500 pounds, these powerful cats are at the top of the food chain, and there have been many instances of man falling prey to this animal king. The ox is nothing less than the king of domestic beasts, the bearer of great burdens, giving itself willingly to sacrifice. And the eagle, well, the eagle in the cherub actually isn't an eagle. The original Hebrew points to a different bird. For centuries now, a mistranslation has plucked great symbolic power from the head of the cherub. In the Bible, the king of birds is the Nesher. Nesher is usually translated as eagle, but if we look at the various descriptions of the Nesher given throughout scripture, we see that it can't be the eagle. First of all, the Nesher is described as being bald. Now, eagles are not bald. Even the American bald eagle is not actually bald. It has white feathers on its head, and it was originally called the baldy-headed eagle. In Old English, baldy meant white, so it was the white-headed eagle. Eventually, that name, Baldy-Headed Eagle, became shortened to Bald Eagle. But it's not bald. In addition, the Nesher is described in scripture as feeding on carrion, and eagles usually take live prey. So which bird is bald and feeds on carrion? It's this bird behind me, the griffin vulture, largest and most magnificent bird of prey in the Middle East. This is the Nesher of scripture. This is the bald bird that feeds on carrion. And those facts are actually connected. Being bald means that it can insert its head into the carcasses of the animals that it's eating without getting blood and guts caught up in the feathers of its head. It's also the lord of the air, the highest flying bird. In fact, the altitude record for a bird is held by a griffin vulture, one of which once collided with an airplane at an amazing 37,000 feet. They even have special lungs which enable them to breathe at that altitude. The question is, if the Nesher is actually the griffin vulture, why does everybody think it's the eagle? The answer is that these translations took place in Europe. In Europe, there aren't so many griffin vultures, but there are a lot of very large and prominent eagles. That's the bird that Rome portrayed on its banners. However, in the land of the Bible, it's not the eagle which is the king of birds. It's the griffin vulture. The correct translation for Nesher puts powerful meaning lost for centuries back into the cherub. The griffin vulture is the highest flying bird in the world which fits well with the cherub's soaring and divine purpose. But a vulture signifies death. In the earthly realm, the natural world, it feeds on the dead. We can say that these two extreme natures of the Nesher mirror man's potential for virtue or for sin. The two extreme natures of the vulture also fit perfectly inside the cherub's divine double function. Cherubim always function as a kind of in-between figure. They are mediators between the divine and the human, between these two realms. One of the roots of the word keruvim in Hebrew goes back to a, an Akkadian meaning of gatekeeper. You think about what a gatekeeper does. A gatekeeper prevents access through a gate, but a gatekeeper also provides access through a gate. And I think that cherubim serve in this same double way. On the one hand, they may serve as guardians to prevent entrance. On the other hand, they may serve as access points, as entry points.
In Ezekiel's vision, the cherubim do open the gates to the divine and carry Ezekiel through the night skies to God. And later references to this angel suggest that in the end of days, the cherubim will once again open the gates to paradise and let humankind back into the garden. And so, we are back where we started, in the Garden of Eden with the serpent. Along the way, we've deciphered the secrets, solved the mysteries, and discovered that there is truth behind the beasts. But how does the serpent's story end? According to the Bible, it was banished from the garden, which is under the ever-watchful eyes of the cherubim. It's their job to make sure this beast never enters paradise again.